Now let's uh, get into God's word. Like I said, Acts chapter 11. We're going to finish out the chapter tonight, okay? Verses 19 through 30 is where we are. 19 through 30. Hang on here. Let me, let me pull that up on this little machine of mine. So let's see. Uh, I had told you guys, I think it was this Sunday past or perhaps the Sunday before. I, I can't quite remember, but um, right now, somebody very close to me is on the other side of the world uh, in India following after a guru, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. I was talking about mysticism. And I was talking about, you know, those who have so-called supernatural experiences with the Lord or with, with quote, a God. Anyway, so this person who I'm very close to is there for a couple of months following after this mystic. And I sure appreciate your prayers because I know many of you have been praying for my family and praying for me, and I sure love you and thank you for that. Um, I, was, I was thinking about it, though, this week and how, of course, even while this person is there on the other side, there is hope. Like there is hope, isn't there? There is hope that right over there, even in the middle of some mystic saying his thing, that Jesus can, in one way or another, reveal himself, the gospel message revealing itself and going to this individual, my beloved, and this, my beloved, being transformed in, in Christ. It can happen because that's the God that he is. Something miraculous happening like that that is a hope that I cling to every single day. It is a prayer in my devos every single day. Lord, would you reveal through your gospel some miraculous way this to happen right now, just like right now. And I'll get a phone call or a text or something that says, you know, Raj, guess what happened? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Jesus is my savior. And I will pray pass, I will fall over dead and be happy. You know what I mean? It'll be that kind of thing. But I was thinking about uh, something that happened actually in India. This was in 2010. You might have heard about this. It was eight years ago, almost nine years ago, when in the state of Bihar, India, it's kind of the northeastern section of the country. It's about the size of like a I don't know, like a, like a Tennessee or something, okay? But it has 100 million people living in it, 100 million people. And of that 100 million, 0.1% Christian. 0.1% Christian. So a couple of Indian men who were Christians felt the call to go to Bihar, that state, and share the gospel just start telling people there about Jesus. So they went. They didn't really have a plan, but they just started walking up to people. You know, they were very poor. There were villages everywhere. They would just walk into villages and start saying, hey, have you ever heard about Jesus? Hey, can we tell you how you are saved in Jesus? And they did this, I think it was for several weeks, and basically nobody listened. Basically nobody listened. And they had kind of you know, lost their motivation. They were a little down. You know, they were real honest about it. This is, this is a bummer and we don't want to do it anymore. So they actually ended up just about to leave when some American uh, uh, evangelists, some American Christians were actually there, ran into them and said, hey, why don't you let us give you a little evangelistic training? Just let us at least tell you a few things about sharing the gospel and then you can go. So they hung out with these American Christians. They got a little training. And in the end, it was like this. And I wrote this down. It said, here's your, oh, oh yeah, here's your intro line. So they were supposed to say this every time they met somebody. And they were supposed to go first to a village where Jesus had never been heard of. So that was their first thing. And then this is what they were supposed to say to every single person that they ran into. We're here in the name of Jesus Christ, and we just want to pray for your village. Supposedly, that was like they're in, go do it. 
So the men went and they found a village that they figured nobody had ever heard of Jesus before. And they started going basically person by person saying, we're here in the name of Jesus Christ and we would like to pray for your village. Same thing. Nobody took. Nobody, nobody cared. You know, they basically brushed them off and said, yeah, you do whatever you want to do. <laughs> I got to go, you know, I got to go pick chicken eggs out of the chicken coop or something. And, and so, again, they were a little disheartened just before they were about to leave. You know, everybody takes the train, so they were going to get it to the train station. And a man from the village, they sort of ran into a, a man from the village who they, you know, they didn't recognize him. So they said, you know, we're here in the name of Jesus. And, and as soon as he said the word, they said the word Jesus, the guy cut them off. And he said, oh, Jesus, 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 I believe that I have heard of Jesus before. Would, would you be willing to tell me more about this Jesus? <laughs> you know, now they're shaking. They just want to yell out, oh, dear God, yes, we want to tell you more. But they're kind of cool. And they're like, sure, sure, we'll tell you a little bit more about Jesus. And the man invites him to go back to his house. So they follow him. They go to his house. And in the living room is his family. And there were some friends there. So he, they had a little audience, and so the man says, well, why don't you tell us all about this Jesus? And so there they are, and they're able to tell the family and the friends about Jesus. They give them the gospel message, and, and lo and behold, they started listening, and they started saying, well, we want that too. And their story goes that over the next two weeks, all 20, there were 20 people listening to these guys. All 20 came to Christ. It's like that. All 20 came to Christ. Yeah, but the story gets better. <laughs> I know we all just love that. We could jump up and down, but the Lord doesn't stop there. So fast forward three years. So 2013, remember that happened in 2010. Now in 2013, these two men... They had left in 2010. These two men went back to Bihar along with some Christian evangelistic organization. I don't remember the name, but you, could, you can look this up. So they go back to, to Bihar and they look. <laughs> there had been planted 350 churches in that state in three years time. Now this evangelistic association, they don't just say, oh, you got a church in your living room? Good, we'll call it a church. Like they actually had standards by which a church, you know, would have to be called a church. You had to, you had to uh, teach God's word. You raised up disciples, all of those things. 350 of these so-called legit churches in three years years. Now, remember, that's 2013. I couldn't find statistics since then. And what are we, almost in 2019? So you think if 350 churches got planted in three years, what's happened over the next five or six years? Who knows? I'm going to be very optimistic, though, very optimistic about what happened there. So I've known this story. In fact, I think I gave you this story a couple of years ago. So some of you might be like, yeah, Raj, we heard that one. But uh, I remembered it again as all of this was happening in my life over the last few weeks, and this person went to India, and I just thought, Lord, you are God. You are the God of miracles. The gospel, it, it gets out there by your power and by your strength. Remember, these men were going to leave, and they were never coming back until the last guy in the village bumps into him and says, oh, yeah, Jesus, can you tell us about him? And three years later, 350 churches spring up. Um, it's, it was a, it was, here, here's, here's where I think the Lord led me to as I was studying on Acts chapter 11, particularly verses 19 through 30. And that was this. I read the last quote from these guys. They were asked after they were just in shock and awe, right, about what had happened. Somebody from the organization said, you know, three years ago, there was no fruit. Like you were on the verge of giving up. And then 
something happened. Tell us, you know, what happened? How? How did you, how did you get to this place? Thinking that maybe these men had come up with a tactic. Or these men had come up with a script or something like that. And the pastor who's recording this goes, I had my paper and I had my notepad and I was ready to write down their tactics so that I could spread it to other people in India. And he goes, the two men basically threw their hands up and they said, we don't know. God. And that was the end of their insight as to what had happened. We don't know. God. And I thought about Acts chapter 11, and I thought about Christianity today. And you know what our faith needs to be? It needs to be that powerful, and it needs to make lots of jaws drop. And the gospel needs to go out, and people need to go, Jesus, and they need to hear about who Jesus is, and something is supposed to spark their hearts. And they're supposed to say, I want him. And and disciples are supposed to be multiplied. That's what's supposed to happen today today right here in our community, let alone 12,500 miles away. And that's what, that's, what we need to, that's what we need to believe will happen. But the way we want it to happen is in essence this. In the end, when we, when we study it and a guy like me overstudies it and I'm trying to figure out what it is, I want to be able to throw up my hands too and just say, I don't know, God. That's all I know. All I know is that it's God. I want there to be a movement. (coughs) Excuse me. I want there to be a movement where lives are transformed, where churches are planted, where disciples are multiplied, where the gospel just goes out. It travels like wildfire. And all we can say is no one but God is responsible for this. And my fear is that churches, Christians, we lose the passion. We get so lost let's say, in the season. It's so easy because after all, the season, we say, remember the reason for the season. And when we have an opportunity, we tell people about what Christmas is. But I don't know how often that actually happens. I guess I'm not going to take a poll, but I guess just for you to answer this question in your own heart, how many people have you told this season what Christmas is about? I would, I would wager half of you haven't told anybody about it. Christmas. That's just my guess, but I'm going to say that's, that's the case. Now, I'm not laying any blame or, or you know, I don't want to stress you out or anything. That's not my purpose. What I, what I want us to do, though, is to be ever aware that there is a God of miracles who wants to work through his people. All they have to do is be willing to let him work through them. They just have to They just have to be willing to bump into people in the village, so to speak, and say, hey, you know what? I'm here to pray in the name of Jesus or some line, whatever it might be. And then just trust that Jesus is going to do something uh, in you and through you. This This is what I want for me, and this is what I want 12,500 miles away, and this is what I want for you here today. Jesus is coming back, and we don't know when. Could be in the next five minutes, could be in the next five days. I I don't know. But what I do know is that God wants to move. God wants to work through his people. God wants his people to have their jaws drop because he does an amazing and miraculous work through them. You guys, this is the God that we serve. Anyway, so so you can tell I'm a little passionate on this one um, because it's very personal to me. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30, it's, it's that. Like, this is that. This is, this is where it's recorded in Bible history, in Christian history. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. You know what? It's actually picking up from Romans, or Romans, Acts chapter 8, which was about the spread of the gospel, which was about the planting of churches, which was about Christians going from place to place. Because remember, Stephen got murdered, and they were getting all persecuted in, in Jerusalem, and so Boom, out they go. Romans chapter, why am I saying Romans? I don't know. Maybe God's setting us up for something. But Acts chapter 11 picks up there. All right, that's where it goes. It's a, I know it's a little out of order there, scriptural in the Bible. Chronologically, that's where it stands. All right, this is what I want to do. You know what I want to do first before we get into the text is to pray. So bow your heads, please. Let's 
Let's just call upon the Lord to bless this evening together. Lord, we do that. First is acknowledging that you are God. Lord, that uh, we, we joyfully throw up our hands and say, we don't know but God. Lord, this evening we pray for your anointing on our time together. We pray, Lord, just for the power of your spirit to fall afresh on each and every one of us. Lord, as we study your word, God, as we read these words and consider these words, Lord, um, that you would give us mighty power to discern these words, to understand them. Lord, to um, be nourished by them, to feed on them. Lord, we pray for wisdom and we pray for the boldness and power to live these words out for your glory. By faith, Lord, we know uh, these words, boy, they will not return void. And so we pray for that tonight. We just pray that you would bless all the ministries going on in our wonderful church right now. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 19. Let me read just 19 and 20 right now. Here's what, here's what Luke writes. Remember, Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen travel, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus." So first and foremost, here is what the Lord allows us to see. God is going to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You see that Peter is not named. You see James is not named, not John, not any of the apostles. All it tells us here is that some people went in Acts chapter 8, remember what I told you? Let me read you a little bit from there. Here's what it says in verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. Who are they talking about? Whose execution? Stephen's. That's right, Stephen. Here's what it says next. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. That's what chapter 11 is referring to. And they were all all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. What do you know? Like I said, no Peter, no John, and no James, no Philip, none of those guys. This was just a bunch of ordinary guys and gals. Oh, ordinary guys and gals. This is us. This is who it is that God sent out after the persecution was rampant in Jerusalem. Guys and gals, Christians just went out and they, they weren't scholars, they weren't seminary graduates, they weren't professional speakers, they were just some people, ordinary. And God was gonna use those ordinary ones to do God's extraordinary work. Verse 20 says that they are the ones who started, listen about Antioch, is considered one of the all-time greatest churches in Christian history, the Church of Antioch. So these ordinary people are out there and they are gonna be used to begin to plant, to populate one of the most important churches in Christian history. I mean, Jesus just scatters them. And they respond to the scattering. And they share the, the gospel and they make disciples for Jesus. They, they, they make followers, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit in them, but they make followers of Jesus. These people are, they are not just disciples, but disciple makers. Considering the Great Commission, you know, that's what we're supposed to be as well. By the way, a disciple, that's a, that's sort of a Christianese term, sort of. Um, what is a disciple in the context of Scripture? A disciple would be a follower of Jesus 
who's committed to learning from him and living for him, following his commandments. Somebody who learns from him, lives for him, and follows his commandments. This would be a disciple. Now you could say, well, then yeah, disciples have to be disciple makers because that's part of what Jesus tells us we got to do. We're supposed to go out there. We're supposed to share the word of God. We're supposed to baptize. We're supposed to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to make these disciples. It's what the Lord calls us to. But to make disciples, God wants disciples. And disciples don't have to be professional preachers. And disciples don't have to be those seminary graduates. And disciples don't have to be extraordinary in anything. All they have to do is be faithful to the call. A, a, a faithful, faith filled in the call. That's what I was talking about when I opened this up about what happened over in India and what's supposed to happen here today. You're supposed to be faithful to the call, but you're supposed to be faith filled in the call. And when you put those two things together, disciples, you are going to become disciple makers. These disciple makers became disciple makers and they're the ones who went out and planted all of these churches. You know, these disciples who were disciple makers, who were disciple makers and so on and so on, it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard sometimes to appreciate what a struggle how difficult. It, it, it's sometimes hard for us because things are just so convenient. They're right at our fingertips and travel, no big deal. We can get there. But to consider this, uh, Jerusalem to Antioch, 300 miles away, and for them to be able to plant the great, one of the greatest churches in church history, just to consider that, you guys, the only way they did it is because not only were they faithful, but they were faith-filled. They went for it. And they worked. And they did it. Again, can I go back to that statement? God used ordinary people to do some super duper, <laughs> extraordinarily awesome. Is that my statement from before? Something like ordinary people to do extraordinary things. By the way, those, those first two guys I told you about in India, you know what their professions were? One was a chicken farmer and one of them was a teacher. That's it. A chicken farmer and a teacher. And that's what has happened since. We have some white collar workers here, blue collar workers here. We've got students in this church. We've got retired folk in this church. We've got stay at home moms in this church. We've got every kind of person. You know, God doesn't look at that label, does he? He doesn't. He looks at the fact that you're his son or you're his daughter. And that's all it takes. That's your qualification right there. Once you meet that qualification, you're in it. You become that worker. You become that disciple that God wants to do those extra, extraordinary things through. So, hey, you know, you smile and you say, thank you, Lord. I mean, my, oh my, it seems like such a massive call, but thank you, Lord, because I know that you're going to do it. I know that the power is not mine. I know that I don't have to come up with the tactics. I know that you will lead me through it and perhaps use me to plant the next Antioch. I don't know, why not? How about it? How about if we have those sorts of dreams as Christians? Guys, I think Christians underestimate themselves too much or their goals are like down here. You know, they say the sky is the limit. We get to go beyond the sky. Heaven is our limit. But it's, but it's very easy to get trapped. The mentality of that, well, this is all I got, so this is all I get, and this is all I get to do. And that's not, that's not what the Lord wants his people ever to think, ever to think. If you have goals as high as heaven, then you know what? You, you pray nonstop to the God of heaven. You let him empower you. You let him motivate you. You let him excite you. You let him encourage you. You be careful of those naysayers. You be careful of the discouragement that the enemy wants to sort of hurl, you know, the darts going your way. You wanna be careful of those things. You have to be conscien uh, consci conscientious of those things. Because when you are, man, not only are you ready, but you almost look at that as, man, that's my, 
that's what means go. That's like the, the um, start done is when those things start coming my way. This is what God wants out of all of us. And I'm talking to you and I'm talking to me. He wants it out of all of us. Don't you be satisfied to be Christian in laissez-faire mode, okay? No indifference, no apathy. God wouldn't have you here if all he wanted was a lazy person. He wants somebody who's on fire to go for it. He's put people in your lives. He, he wants you to talk to them. He's giving you difficult challenges. Why? Because in the challenge, some way, somehow, you are able to glorify him. Not grope and go, oh, oh, woe is me. No, this is a, this is a God that's too great for his people to sort of shortchange him like that. That's how, that's how it happened. Man, if those acts, if those acts, uh, Christians had done that, oh, I'm, I'm getting, you know what, here's a problem. I am so far ahead of myself right now on my, my message that I don't even know where I am, but God will get me back. That's okay, God will get me back. <laughs> if only you knew how often that happened to me when I'm up here. Some of you are like, yeah, Raj, we do know how often that happens. Um, I want to read a quote of a preacher who was working in China. Very, very, um, uh, uh, maybe you've uh, heard of him, Watchman Nee. Anybody heard of Watchman Nee? Yeah, a few of you have. All right, so what a life. Got to read about that guy, but listen to, listen to his quote. He said, the church is suffering not so much from the prominence of the five talent members as from the holding back of the one talent members. The life of the whole body is hampered and impoverished by the burial of those single talents. We must be careful not to exalt the unique giftings of particular leaders with particular talents while we ignore the Holy Spirit gifting in every single person in the body of Christ. How true that every, he's right on, every single person. Don't ever bury the talent that God has given to you. You use it for his, his glory. Um, is the most, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you know, you guys, we're going to have a state of the church message and, and share the vision of this church. But I've told you so many times, what God's put on my heart is this community. I mean, we are reaching out more and more to them, right? We have ministries springing up you don't even know about yet, but you're going to know about them. Um, it's, it's because they're dead. I mean, there's life here, and this life needs to be, quote, contagious, unquote. It needs to get out there. And so I was thinking about it in this sense is the most effective way to bring life to this community, trying to get the community to come in to the confines of these walls. It's effective. And I always want you to invite people to come to this church. And I want you to hand out those cards. And I want you to tell them that you listen to a pastor that kind of goes off the path sometimes. Nonetheless, you still learn something every now and again. I want that. But I think the more effective way is for the hundreds of people who actually go to this church to go out there and share the life and the light, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we don't want it to be limited to a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night. We want it to, man, we want to take this community seven days a week. We're in different neighborhoods. We're in different job places. We're in different schools. And this is the kind of thing that God is enabling us to do. Um, one of the things they, they tell pastors in preparation for like state of the church messages, you know, have a ministry strategy. There's all these words that they tell you you should, you know, fill in the blanks. I was thinking about the ministry strategy as a church. And to me, ordinary people doing extraordinary things is a pretty good ministry strategy. By the, power of, by the power of God, outside of the confines of these walls. I think that's a good one. I think it's very important, of course, because we are called to win 
and equip and send. That's what Calvary Chapel is all ever since Pastor Chuck in Costa Mesa. That's what every Calvary does. We somehow, some way, we weave in. You win, you equip, and you release. And that'll never stop. But there has to be so much more. And yet it's so simple to say, by doing uh, ordinary people, doing extraordinary things by the power of God. So Acts 11 shows you that the ordinary people went out. And what did we say? They were on the verge of being murdered. They go everywhere they go, and they end up planting one of the greatest churches in Christian history, and that is the Church of Antioch, which, by the way, we'll be looking at that church as we study Acts more, okay, in future studies. So another, another part that I want you to see in, in this particular section is it's more about us, oh, ordinary people, with the opportunity to do extraordinary things, and that's this, in serving the Lord, in carrying out y- your commission, inevitably suffering is a part of accomplishing the work, okay? It is, it is God-ordained. Nobody wants to hear that. What? Suffering is God-ordained? It's not an accident? No, it's God-ordained. I mean, if your suffering comes as a result of your sin, hey, but when you are working to do extraordinary things for Christ, suffering is an inevitable part of that. All throughout the New Testament, whenever they're sharing the gospel, the people went out and and the people who heard the gospel became Christians not despite suffering. They became Christians precisely because of suffering. They saw these guys who were sharing the gospel and they looked at the background of the guy sharing the gospel and they're like, hey dude, weren't you about to get murdered next to Stephen? And they'd be like, yeah, that was me. (laughs) This is totally Raj just putting this out there, okay? But this is like, yeah, that was, I did. I was in Jerusalem and they were killing Christians and so I ran off. I didn't even go home to get my clothes. Now, let me tell you about Jesus. And it says that the gospel went out and basically Christians multiplied. No, it's not despite suffering. It's precisely because of suffering that work is extraordinary. Um, And it totally, it makes sense. Here's the logic to it. It makes total sense. Because we have been saved from our sins by a suffering savior. This is how he brought us to the God of heaven. And so it makes total sense. He was killed. He was crucified. He was nailed to a cross for us. We're saved because of a suffering savior. So it definitely makes sense that the news of a suffering savior will spread through suffering servants. The news of a suffering savior will spread through suffering servants. Philippians 1 verse 29 says, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. That's one of those that I really wish I could put an X through and say, God, not this one. But it is the case. 1 Peter 4, rejoice as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Now, one important difference is that Jesus suffered to accomplish salvation, and you and I suffer to spread salvation. This is something that we should be so appreciative of, that it should actually motivate us. If I'm in the middle of suffering, and I'm trying to share the gospel, remembering that Jesus suffered just so salvation could happen is enough to spark me to get through it and to be able to say, okay, I'll bear it. Because what you did for me, Lord, they they need to know and they need to receive that. Suffering is also for your sanctification. Suffering is to make you more like Christ. Suffering is something that sets you apart from the world. Why? Because when you suffer, you don't get depressed and say, woe is me, I can't take it. What you say is, you know what? I have a suffering savior that that cares for me and will never leave me nor forsake me. 
I have a suffering Savior who loves me more than I can know. I have a suffering Savior who says he will take care of my every need. All I need to do is seek him first. See, that's the way we respond to suffering. And that's why, like I said, it's, you're sanctified. You're set apart. Remember, sanctified means set apart. You're literally set apart in the eyes of the world. And when they see you set apart like that, you know what they say? How can she be like that? Why is it that he can still say, I'm fine today, and actually mean that he's fine today? Not just go, I'm fine today. You know, like it's on a recording, yeah, I'm fine today. Click. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's because of that joy, even when he is in the midst of his suffering. Suffering is significant, but as weird as it sounds, it's supposed to be something we appreciate. It's supposed to be something that we'll thrive in as carriers of the gospel message. It's what compelled them, and it's what needs to compel you and me. Look, you guys, to be Christians is costly. To be representatives of Jesus Christ costs. Jesus said, basically, you better give it all, or you're not worthy to be my, my, um, my, uh, my disciple. Uh, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you time and it's going to cost you money and it's going to cost you relationships and it's going to make you be a giver when it's only fair that you become a taker it's going to it's going to it's going to try if you're not careful you will fall into the trap of discouragement you will be entrapped you will be stuck and say there's only so much that I can pay for this but that's when you look to God and you say, wow, look what God paid. He paid it all. He gave his only begotten son. And if he can do that, then you know what? Any cost is reasonable. Any cost is worth it. Don't fall into the enemy's trap, okay? Remember again that this is all God's design. Um, God has ordained suffering as a means by which salvation through Christ is spread. Um, he has ordained suffering to show that Jesus Christ is more valuable than health or wealth or possessions, or people, or pursuits, or comforts, or pleasures, or anything else. This is why it has to be done that way. It only makes sense. How weird would it be if everything was always right for us, and yet we try to go out to the world and say, oh, but you need a suffering savior. Yeah, I got a lot of money. Oh, everything's cool. Oh man, I am, the doctor says I'm going to live to be 200. I am in such good shape. I don't know any of us want to live to 200, right? No, it wouldn't make sense. He's, he's a suffering savior and I'm his servant. And so if it means suffering for my savior, then I'll do it. And that has to be part of your passion, right? God wants us to see things so differently than the world does. Suffering brings down in the world. Suffering lifts us up in Christ. Um, Acts 7, Acts 8, Acts 11, all because of suffering servants who were on fire to tell the world about their suffering Savior. That's what it is, okay? Acts 7, Acts 8, Acts 11. <laughs> yeah, it's just thinking about the enemy. You know you're always a target, and so am I. Um... In this whole story, you just consider how in Acts 7, he thinks that he has taken down God's greatest mouthpiece of the gospel, Stephen, right? He's taken him down. He perhaps is thinking that he's won. Like this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is what he needed to do. But in the very next verse, 
after Stephen is martyred, it says, and I read this to you, that all the servants scattered, all the servants shared the gospel, and people everywhere were getting saved. That's what the, can I put it this way? That's what the work of the devil, even though that's not really true, but that's what the devil thought was going to happen. He was taking them all down, but instead the church only multiplied. The church only grew. Never fall into the trap that you have an enemy that's too strong for you. Never, never, never say, oh, the enemy's got, you know, this control over me or he has done something that I am now sort of a victim of. You, you're not. Well, I taught about this I, two or three weeks ago or something about basically that Satan has no power over you. That's what the scripture teaches. Now, if you give him a foothold, that's a little bit of a different deal. But every time he tried, you see in scripture where God uses what he intended for bad for the glory of Christ. And it just happened again and again and again. What uh, here, this is a quote I heard somebody else speak. It says this, what Satan does in attempting to stop the church will ultimately serve to spread the church. I like that. That's gonna be one of my lines now. <laughs> I'm claiming that for me, okay? That's one of my lines now. But God is in control, that's why. He has a plan and a purpose for you. He even has a plan and a purpose for the enemy. The enemy has no control over God. He will be a victor. And you and I have victory in the victor. And I'm talking about Christ Jesus himself. Here, I want to read a, a story. This was really intriguing to me. It was a pastor. He uh, said that he used to preach in Romania. And he uh, suffered a lot of persecution. In fact, he said he was persecuted many, a, a lot. He was arrested many times. He was beaten and he was whipped. And he had his life threatened many times. Listen to what he writes. Um, he says... There was a time when I was arrested by, a police, by the police and they were questioning and threatening me. And I said to the officer, sir, let me explain to you how I see this issue. Your supreme weapon is killing. Remember, he's spreading the gospel and they're saying, if you keep doing that, we are going to kill you. So this is what he says. Sir, let me explain to you how I see this issue. Your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. Here is how it works. You know that my sermons on tape have spread all over the country. If you kill me, those sermons will be sprinkled with my blood. Everyone will know that I died for my preaching, and everyone who has a tape will pick it up and say, I better listen again to what this man preached, because he truly meant it. He sealed it with his life. So, sir, my sermons will speak 10 times louder than before. I will actually rejoice in this supreme victory if you kill me. He wrote, after I said this, the officer sent me home. <laughs> <laughs> the officer ended up telling a different pastor who was being persecuted, you know that pastor? He wanted to die a martyr. And we were not foolish enough to fall for his trap, so we let him go. <laughs> and you know, the pastor's like chuckling under his breath, like, oh yeah, you let him go? You think you won? <laughs> now the gospel's just going to go out all the more because of that. And in fact, the pastor writes more. Listen, here's what he says. He goes, I stopped to consider the meaning of their statement. I remember how for many years I'd been afraid of dying. I had kept a low profile because I wanted so badly to live that I wasted my life in inactivity. But now that I had placed my life on the altar and had decided that I was ready to die for the gospel, they were telling me that they would not kill me. I could go wherever I wanted in the country and preach to whomever I wanted knowing I was safe. As long as I was trying to save my life, I was losing it. Now that I was willing to lose it, I found it. What, a, what an awesome perspective. Suffering is going to be a part of our lives, but God will take your suffering and turn it into something glorious no matter what. You guys, we have a call. Let nothing draw you away from the call. Let not wealth and let not poverty draw you away. Let not magnificent health 
or perhaps a terminal illness draw you away. Whatever it is, however it is, and whenever it is, God wants to use you as one of his servants to make, to be a disciple and to make disciples of others. Take the gospel. Take the message of Christ and share it with them because they need it so badly. God always wins and you have victory in him. Well, <laughs> I'm like on my third verse right now. <laughs> I told you guys, I'm so out there, but we'll do it still, okay? Look at verse um, 22. News travels back to Jerusalem. Remember now, they've just planted Antioch 300 miles away, greatest church of all time, or one of, and it says this in verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Remember Barnabas? Acts chapter 4 is where we hear of him first. Joseph the Levite is his name, Joseph the Levite. But the apostles are like, you know what, we're going to rename you. Um, you're now son of encouragement, which is what Barnabas translates into. You're now Barnabas. And he gives generously to the church. And then it says in chapter 9 where Saul becomes Paul and he comes to the Jerusalem church and the Jerusalem church goes, no way, this dude isn't really saved. Get him out of here. He just wants to murder us. And Barnabas comes along and says, hey, guys, hold on now. This is a real conversion. And, and Paul is able to join the church because of what Barnabas has done. I mean, this guy's cool. He, he you know, I have here, he was a money giver and a peacemaker, and now he's a hip shaker. Listen to why I said that. Verse 23, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. That's the key word right there, glad. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get it in the original Greek. It's Cairo, chi almost like Cairo, Cairo. And what it means is like an exceeding rejoicing. And so the way I'm picturing is that he's dancing when he gets to Antioch and he sees everything that he sees. So that's why I said he's a hip shaker. He's a guy who really likes what he's seeing. He's like, yes, Lord. And he's dancing around and parading a little bit and realizing this is my time to serve. This is my time to step in now. God, I've got a call here. You guys, this is us too. Whatever it is that the Lord leads you to, you look for the opportunity to serve and get in it. Get in it and or shake your hip if you got to and then get into the work of God. It says here, he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Hey guys, I hope that They'll say that in your eulogy. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. <laughs> I really do. I'm not just saying that. I hope that that's something that they could say for me too. Ladies, you too, except a good, not a man, a good, a good woman, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Because there's always going to be results when you are that. I, the Bible tells you that. And would you look at the results? A great many. A great many were added to the Lord. Um, the Holy Spirit, you are the temple of, huh? The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, he works in you. And it says that he works through you. We are baptized with the Holy Spirit. We are given gifts um, by the Spirit. And when God ordains you with his gifts, he doesn't just want you to sit on them. He gives them to you so that you'll exercise them. And when I had taught this before, I told you there are two primary reasons for the gifts of the Spirit. One, the edification of the body. And two, addition to the body. That is to say, converting and equipping. These are the primary purposes of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit aren't for me to get better me. The gifts of the Spirit are supposed to be through me to you. Some may say that I have the gift of teaching, perhaps so, but I must utilize that gift for your good, not my good. And this, it's, it's what all of our call, that's, it's the call for all of us. Now it says here, please look again, he exhorted them, okay? He exhorted them, uh, parakaleo in the Greek, and what it is is sort of a mixture, it's, it's, um, 
encouragement. In fact, some of the older translations actually say encourage, not exhortation. I don't, I don't really like that because there is an important nuance, okay? There's an important nuance between encourage and exhort. Exhort contains encouragement, but encouragement does not contain exhort. Exhortation comes with, I got to be careful now, not necessarily authority. Now, you could, in fact, I would argue, as a pastor, when I exhort you, I do have authority over you. In other words, when I tell you that you ought to do something and I use God's word to tell you this is why, basically, you should do it. It's not because Raj is now telling you to do it. It's because God has used me to tell you, go now and do. This would be exhortation, let's say, from the pulpit. But exhortation as far as Christian to Christian, maybe not necessarily authority, but let's just say, how about expectation? Is that a better word? Uh, Husbands and wives, we have the right, I believe. (laughs) I better qualify. No, I'll just be careful. Just trust me on this, okay? I'm going to do a marriage series soon. I'll explain it then. But but, um, we have the right to expect our spouses to respond when we exhort them in the things of Christ. Okay, notice I qualified that very well. When we exhort them in the things of Christ. We don't have to say, you know, something like, I hate turnips, I don't want them in my house anymore. That could be an exhortation, but it's not something, by the way, Missy does not say that, okay? But (laughs) nevertheless, it wouldn't be something that I have to go, well, okay then. But I do remember some years ago when I first became um, senior pastor here, I I was much more business-like. Like, I'm a lot more peppy and stuff on the stage than I was several years ago. And sometimes it would just come across like I was just some professor, you know, well, this is what we do next, and here's what the gifts of the Spirit mean, and here's how you're supposed to apply them. God bless you. Have a good day. You know, that's, that's, probably, that's why I never listened to myself from back then. But, um, but, uh, but, but um, Missy had, had quoted to me a verse, and and it was um, out of uh, Peter, 1 Peter 3, where Peter is compelling the people to be tenderhearted, right? He says to be tenderhearted with one another. And there's a lot more sweet stuff in that passage, 1 Peter 3, 8. And, and so she was telling me that, you know, when, when, you're, when you sound like that and you're up at the pulpit, you know, I, that may be missing, <laughs> Like there might be a little bit of tender heartedness that I have toward you, but you didn't know because that's the way I was talking to you. And so when she was telling me that, you know, it's not like she said you better or else, but she was being an exhorter that I believe God put there before me so that I would consider what she was saying. And it was scriptural. It was Christ-like. And as I prayed, I, I, I realized it's a change that I needed to make. And so I really loved that. God used her in that way, but that was what I would call exhortation. It would be a little bit different than encouragement. <laughs> she might encourage me, you know, not to lean on the pulpit like, like it's my TV, like where I put my coffee for my TV or something. She might say, you know, maybe you ought to think about it. I mean, ah, whatever. But <laughs> this is actually a pretty comfy pulpit. Um, but that would be more perhaps encouragement. But the exhortation, let me get back, let me get back on track. So the exhortation is something that Barnabas did. And the, the, obviously what he did was he responded because that's a gift the Spirit gave him. It's, it's something that you have to be very careful of because exhortation is that close to authority. It's, it can have expectation. Remember the word that I used, the differentiation. Expectation versus authority. Husbands and wives, we can expect things from each other. But... I can't command Missy to do something, nor can she command me to do anything. Barnabas understood what his gifting was, and clearly he exercised it. And when we exercise, what did I say happens? The church is edified or the church is built up. And this is exactly what you see here. It says a great many people were added 
to the Lord. <coughs> the, um, one of the important responsibilities for God's people to do is to pray very specifically for the gifts of the Spirit. Now, whether, whether you're supposed to pray for one in particular, certainly so. Um, but one of the things that Scripture, I believe, teaches, and this is where I have debated with some people in the past, is I don't believe that a person is sort of permanently ordained with a gift. I believe that God grants a gift when the gift is needed to be utilized. Now, I understand. I understand some people have different perspectives on that. But based on what I see in Scripture, when people say, you know, I have the gift of tongues, I don't see that that's something that God said, here you go, it's yours forever and ever. But instead that it's something that he would grant to you if you said, Lord, I pray for the gift of tongues. Lord, I, I pray for a gift, and perhaps at that moment it would be the gift of tongues. So nevertheless, whether you agree with that perspective or not, what you, what you and I absolutely do agree on is that these are, gifts are something that we are supposed to desire. Gifts are something that we are supposed to ask God to grant to us. Gifts are, some, gifts are the working of the Spirit through you. And that's what we want, is the Holy Spirit to work through us. And what Stephen, what God is showing us here is that when you utilize the gifts that he has given to you, God will provide some kind of, let's use the word victory. I'm throwing that out. Victory, success, completeness, wholeness. More than anything, glory of God will provide God the glory. This is, what, this is what we're called to do. So again, a great many people were added to the Lord, Barnabas being full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. So it goes on to this, verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Okay, okay. Let's um, dissect that just a little bit here. What is so cool about Barnabas is that he realized his limitation, didn't he? Why did he, why did he go for Paul? Because he knew who Paul was. Paul, first of all, was called by God himself. You are the one who is going to reach to the Gentiles on my behalf. And here's Antioch. I mean, it had Jews, but it was, it was mostly a Gentile place. You're talking about Turkey. You're talking about up north, up the coast, had some Jews, but it was primarily a Gentile place. And here's Barnabas coming out of Jerusalem, going 300 miles and looking all around, going, oh, okay, okay. It says, he exercised his gift and the church just kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. What is the call of every church? To equip its saints, to teach its saints. And this is where you see that Barnabas goes, okay, this is like my limit. I can't do this anymore but I know who Paul is. And so what does he do? He decides, okay, I'm gonna go because I know that there's somebody else in the body of Christ who can do this better or more effectively or has been given the gift or whatever else. I'm gonna go utilize him. Hey, body of Christ, that's what we do. That's why we are called the body of Christ. We are all different parts, right? Different functions brought together under the head and then we, well, we function well. Here, this is a man that you see what? Exercises great humility. Because what you and I are called to do, you know, is rely on each other. And some of us are so self-dependent, you're looking at one of those guys, sometimes I just need to be smacked in the head. You know, Rod, you can't do it all. As you've got a great team around you, you've got great people in the church, give it up, man. And these are the sorts of things that I so appreciate about the Lord. You have a guy like Barnabas, who was so effective in the church, who goes to the church and goes, I can't do anything anymore. But I do know who can. And he goes 100 miles away. By the way, uh, Antioch from, from uh, Tarsus, 100 miles. So he's like, I know this guy has the gift. He's a gift of teaching. He's got authority. He can do it. So he goes. Oh, and another thing, he hasn't seen Paul, the argument goes, between seven and 10 years it's been between seven and ten years since Barnabas last saw Paul. And he's still praying, though, and considering. And the Holy Spirit says, you know what? Go. Travel a hundred miles. Find that man that I have ordained and bring him back. And so he does. 
You guys, that's, that's what the church does. We, we, we rely upon one another to that extent. We, that's why it's so important for us to formulate relationships. You need, to, you need to love each other. And that doesn't just mean saying, hi, nice to see you again. I'll see you next Sunday. It's about saying, hey, let's go hang out. Let's talk. Let's go to Starbucks. Come over to my house. Let's t- chat in life group. Let's go sit at the cabana and, and talk. Hey, tell me about you and the Lord. Don't, don't talk about Christmas presents per se. Talk about Christmas. Talk about the things of the Lord and see what their gifting is. Hey, what is it that God has led you to? And start getting in each other's lives like that. And you know what's going to happen? Someday you're going to need precisely that gift to be utilized here. And you're going to go, oh yeah, she's got that gift. Or she's got that talent. Or she's got that skill. And then you're going to bring her in. Bring him in. This is what the church needs to do. It says Barnabas did it. And bam, what happens? What happens after that? It says they with the church and taught a great many people. That the, the equivalent is that they were equipped with great knowledge. When it says that they taught many people, they were equipped with great knowledge. God will always honor his people when they utilize their gifts. But you got to utilize your gifts. Okay. Can we just say Paul is pretty cool for waiting seven to ten years before he actually gets used? I mean, some of us might have thrown up our hands, what? seven to 10 days after we were told we were going to get used. But instead he's like, okay, oh, hey, Barnabas, um, about a decade. How's it going? And then Paul, or Barnabas says, come on down, man. We've got some work to do. And from then on, you realize that if Paul would have said no, or if Barnabas would have been too lazy to travel 100 miles, that we wouldn't have any of the 13 letters. We wouldn't have half of the New Testament. If Paul would have said, forget you, It's been 10 years. God promised me something. I haven't done it yet. You know what? If God turns his back on me, I'm turning my back on him. Christians, be ever so careful. Patience. Patience, they say, is a virtue. Patience is something that God demands you to. It's his timing, not my timing. When God is ready to use me, he will. When God is ready to put a ministry in motion, he will put it in motion. It's so easy for the leadership of church. Trust me on this one to get so far ahead of the Lord because we've got the vision. We know what it's supposed to look like to get this community and take them in for Christ. And the Lord's just kind of like, you know what? No, no, that ain't happening. And you just see stuff is not falling into place. You're seeing doors close. And then here's the prayer that I have struggled with. Well, Lord, does that just mean you want me to strengthen my legs so I can kick in the door? That's a total fleshly prayer, by the way. God says, no, just wait. My time will be perfect for you. So this guy waits 10 years and he finally gets there. Okay, so that's the cool thing about Paul on this story and the cool thing about Barnabas on this story. It says they were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, that wasn't a, that wasn't a term to be proud of. Okay, it was a little bit of a belittling term, a little bit of a condescending term. See, the, the term in Greek is uh, Christianos. And if you read Greek literature back in the day, I'm sure all of you read Greek literature from that day, but if you read Greek literature, you see the suffix ianos to indicate a slave of or a servant of. Um, If you were a servant in the house of Caesar, you were Cicerianos. You were a slave of Caesar. If you, and politically, they would use that too. Like if you were a member of the Herodian party, you were a Herodianus. Yeah, that's how it goes. Um, And it just meant that you were, in essence, a slave to your party. I mean, look at the Democrats and the Republicans. They're all slaves to their parties. So, So that's why. So when they said you were Christianos, they were saying, you're just a slave to this Christ. You're just a slave to this Jesus guy. And see, it was belittling, at least from the world's eyes. But you know what the Christians did, right? (laughs) They're like this. Yes, I am. I'm so glad you noticed that. Because I didn't want to just kind of have to tell you. I wanted you to see it. You guys, being called Christians, there's, there's meaning to the word. 
Christian is it's used, it's used almost flippantly. It's, it's, it's used, it's so superficial. Yeah, if you're just a little sort of attached to the church, you're Christian. If your parents' parents were Baptists, you know, you're Christian. And, and to consider the fact that it's Christianos, it, 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 it means that I am a slave intentionally following this master, then how dare we? And you know what else, you guys, is this. I, the way your life is, the way you speak, the way you talk to that, you know, that customer service rep that you just want to reach through the phone and grab them by the neck and like choke them out. Somebody told me, somebody told me that that's what they do. But those people, those people, those people, the people at work, the people at the store, the people in church, the people who you encounter, the people in your family, the people who have offended you, the people who have absolutely been takers and never givers, the people who accuse you of doing anything, everything and not taking any responsibility. You know what those people are supposed to experience? They're supposed to experience a slave of Jesus. They're supposed to be able to say, you are a Christian, not because you told me you were, but because of the way you responded to my accusation. You are a Christian because I just made you work extra hours at work. You saw me go home because I wanted to watch the football game, but somehow, some way, you actually worked in joy. I saw something about you. Are you a Christian? Are you a slave to a different master? Because if that was me, I'd have been so mad, I'd have complained. This is what happened to the church in Antioch. They didn't go out and say to people, would you please call us slaves of Christ? It was people watching them. They're giving, look what, you guys, look what happened. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, let's read this fast and I have to apply it in like 90 seconds. Look at what it says in verse 27. It says, now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Okay, one of them named Agabus, we're gonna see him later too, stood up and foretold by the spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. Uh, this took place in the days of Claudius. Uh, Claudius was reigned from 41, I think, to 52, I think. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This unprecedented. Listen, there is scholarly evidence. I haven't studied it through, but I'll quote it to you with, a, with a, an asterisk, okay? There is scholarly evidence that in, in ancient literature, in ancient historical records, nowhere is there recorded an event where, where one group of of, of not being the same kind, that is to say family or race or culture, never been an event where they have gathered together to send relief to another group. That this is the first recorded event in ancient history where that happened. You got to remember, Antioch, different culture than Judea. Um, um, the Judean guys were Jews. Uh, they were all legalists, former legalists. Antioch, you know, Antioch is one of the grossest cities, like it was all sin-filled. Totally different than Jerusalem. And they, they didn't have anything similar, but for one thing, and that was Christ. And can I go one step further? That they were slaves of Christ. That when people saw the Antioch Christians do what they did, they said, we have never seen a group. We have never seen a people. We have never seen a person who is poor but says let me look through what little <laughs> they'll use wealth in quotes what little wealth i have so that i can give a portion of it to people who are 300 miles away because they're going to face desperation soon it's never happened i mean this is why these guys could be called slaves of christ because only this man named jesus that they kept preaching about would have inspired you to do it nobody would have inspired you to do that Except there's this Jesus, and his story goes like this. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was the son of God. He was God the son, yet he gave himself. And he's my master. So take that. So the way you hear me talk and the way you see me act and the way I respond and the way I don't you know, seek vengeance and all of those things, 
a person is supposed to get, go, that guy must be a Christian. I'm not supposed to go, oh, and by the way, <laughs> I'm a Christian. And that's what the call of every Christian is, okay? You show it before you tell it. They should know by what they see. If you're the kind of person who has an attitude with customer service reps, look, we can make joke of it, but you're in sin. <laughs> the fact of the matter is we get pretty frustrated over lots of stuff and they say, you know, for technical support, call this. And uh, it gets pretty easy to be impatient or people who are helping us or whatever else. No way. Christians, how dare we? We're slaves. We're slaves of Christ. The most gracious, the most giving, the most kind, the most tender-hearted one in all of history. And we're supposed to be like him. So this is why it's so cool that they got called Christians first. Remember what I told you? These were just a bunch of ordinary people doing extraordinary things and by their behavior in one of the ickiest cities in all of, all of um, that region, they actually get recognized as being servants of the Son of God. That is too cool. That's what Christians need to be here. That's what we got to do here Okay, you guys, going way, way back to the beginning now, to the beginning of this study. I talked about how what happened in India needs to happen here. And you and I, we are the ordinary people. Okay, this is supposed to be our incentive. It can happen. But you got to have faith. You got to seek it. You got to be willing to suffer for it. And when you do those things, God will use you to move in the hearts of people who right now are on a travel path to hell going to use you to take them off that and put them on a path to heaven. That's what matters. That's why you're here or else God would take you to heaven right now. Okay. Well, that's it. Let's, uh, let's pray you guys.